All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you to everyone that has joined us this afternoon. This is later than most of our other webinars, but um, you know, thank you all for joining again. This is going to be our first webinar in a series of webinars focusing on high school excellence, and we do have um, a number of amazing speakers on the phone with us today. Again, if you're joining us and listening in via phone or, or via your audio by other means, um, please make sure that you are able to see the slides that we'll walk through today. You can look at it on the screen itself in the web link that you receive via email, um, and you can also look at the slides um, in the PDF of the slides that were sent out earlier today. Um, but without further ado, I will pass it on to Chris Rutherford, who is the Promise of Place Manager based out of Detroit with the Campaign for Achievement. So welcome everyone. Uh, as Jamila mentioned, I am the Promise of Place Program Manager in Detroit, Michigan, and we are super excited to have this discussion today around high school excellence. As all of you know, our challenges across the country with getting black male students to the finish line of completing high school and on to post-secondary education of any kind is extremely daunting. Um, and so as part of our overall mission at the Campaign for Black Male Achievement, uh, we have endeavored to take a deep dive into this problem with our high school excellence framework. And we do this because uh, there's simply no other way to say it, but as our CEO, uh, uh, Sean Dove, all, is often heard saying, the cavalry is not coming, and so we must get this right because failure is not an option. Uh, the, the Campaign for Black Male Achievement a High School Excellence Framework aims to elevate focused attention on ensuring that black men and boys graduate from high school, college, uh, career, and community ready. Uh, we use the High School Excellence Framework uh, to guide CBMA's investments and collaborations across the, uh, across the country. Uh, so the High School Excellence Advisory Board made up of world-class researchers and practitioners and we also uh, have carefully aligned the framework uh, to the best practices as indicated uh, by the advisory board. Uh, Jamila, could you go back one slide? I apologize. So as you all know, uh, CBMA is a national membership network uh, that seeks to ensure the growth and sustainability of leaders and organizations who are committed to improving the life outcome of black men and boys. And uh, the National CBA, CBMA member network has over 5,200 leaders, uh, representing more than uh, 2,700 uh, organizations. And of course, we are rapidly growing. Uh, CBMA is the only organization that both supports local leaders on the ground, while at the same time, uh, we work to amplify and catalyze the movement of black male achievement around the country. And so we are defining and building the future we want for ourselves today, where black men and boys are seen for the limitless asset they are. And to measure our impact, we use the lens of high school excellence. Um, so to give you a little bit of uh, history about um, the uh, Campaign for Black Male Achievement, uh, in 2008, uh, we know that America ushered in a new era uh, as to how it perceives and invests uh, in black men and boys. And this era saw both the election of our nation's first black president and the Campaign for Black Male Achievement launch as part of the Open Society Foundation efforts to address the disparate challenges facing black males in the U.S. And since that launch, as you can see, many others have joined the work. Uh, next slide, please. And so through that initial investment from the Open Society Foundation, CBMA has seeded a number of other organizations across the country, which you can see here, uh, Black Male Engagement, also known as the Me, uh, Cities United, Echoing Green, Black Male Achievement Fellowship, um, as well as the Executive Alliance, My Brother's Keeper Alliance, uh, National League of Cities, New York City's uh, Young Men Initiative, and Rumble Young Man Rumble, one of our signature events here at the Campaign uh, for Black Male Achievement. Uh, and so part of what we do is to offer a wide array of resources to support the growth, as well as the sustainability and impact of our members and the National Black uh, Male Achievement Field. And so our resources can be found, many of our resources can be found on our website, uh, blackmaleachievement.org. 
Uh, next slide, please. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, high school excellence. Uh, the Campaign for Black Male Achievements High School Excellence Framework uh, was developed to elevate the relevant levers we believe uh, will support black men and boys as they transition from high school to college, career, and then ultimately into our communities as citizens. Uh, next slide, please. And so using uh, the identified le uh, levers and activities, uh, CBMA, along with our High School Excellence Advisory Board, uh, believe that our framework will not just increase high school graduation rates, but ensure the schools and communities are supported in the process. And so before we get into our panel discussion, I would like to show a short video which illustrates the challenges uh, we will be talking about. My name is Toussaint Lamont Stone. I am 18 years old and I'm from Oakland, California. I've been going to public school my whole life. So I've had friends from first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth. I have a story to tell you from every grade year. It's like it's always somebody not not making it. Family problems, kicked out of school. My friends have been to jail for things that I've done with them. Like, I knew Donovan since about the third grade. Once he got out, it wasn't the same. Somebody that I've known for so long that I know has the potential to be somebody oh so great is sitting with no more motivation. They just suck all the motivation out of your body before you even are old enough to make a difference. I talk to and encounter too many young black boys who are hyper aware of the fact that their humanity is debated that they go to classrooms with educators who don't believe that they're capable of doing wonderful things. Black children are more likely to be suspended, more likely to be arrested in school. What we've seen over the years are young men being pushed out of school and into a pipeline to prison instead of into a pipeline to college and success. This is final exam day. Exhibition at Met West. Let's get some energy. I'm finally a senior at Met West High School, ready to graduate. To watch you go from this transformation of like struggling who I am in the world to being King Toussaint Stone, I'd like to say I take just a little credit, um, but you can't have transformation unless you commit to something. And you committed to something, brother. I'm the founding executive director of African American Male Achievement for Oakland Unified School District. Our office was created to improve the educational outcomes of African American males from preschool through 12th grade, as well as disrupt uh, the type of structural racism that were perpetuating low expectations, this achievement gap, and a feeling of inadequacy. We as black boys gravitate to the black men in the schools, definitely. I interned in the office for two years now. Baba Chris is like a second father to me. I see myself as a leader. He saw me shine in my light. He's showing me how different I am compared to what everybody expects me to be. Oakland was one of our early entrepreneurial investments. It's created the first of its kind a department of African American male achievement inside a school district. Now I'll be moving into my senior thesis project. I was focused on curriculum building. It's definitely a passion for me. I've been interested in <laughs> black history since I popped out the womb. Part of the perpetuation of internalized oppression and why there is an achievement gap is the prevailing narrative in public school education is a white narrative. Like at first, if you're just so used to being called the N-word, you might hear King and it might catch you from surprise. Like, it's just realizing who you are, where you come from, the wealth of our heritage, the wealth of our ancestry is like, we so much more than what they try to give us credit for. So I guess, yeah, the main things we wanted to go over for this were the final steps uh, for closing out your academics, college next steps. I wanted to go straight into a four year. Of course you did. And then reality just start hitting me from every direction. Because I'll be stepping out of my comfort zone. Growth mm -hmm. is uncomfortable. So I did community college three years. So I wasn't ready to transfer, just me. Emotionally, I wasn't ready. Study skills, I wasn't ready. So actually, community college for me at that time was a great strategy. 
Just know that you have the support underneath you for whatever decision you make for yourself. It's hard for me to make a decision though. Like it really is. You cocky as hell. But it's okay. We see it. You right. Know? We just want you to be wise. That's right. Yeah. Know where you want to go, and that's what we're gonna help you get. It's important for us to start thinking about high school excellence and thinking about education as a vehicle to start measuring how we're succeeding. We reduced suspension rates by 44% as a school district. We've increased the graduation rate now by 20%. For the Kings that are in our Manda development classes, the grade point average has increased by 1.13. Schools, families, the communities, and leaders. We fundamentally believe that if you get those four folks engaged in this work, you're going to see exponential growth, not just in graduation rates, but their ability to function in college, career, and community. Five years from now, we wanna be able to point to some key cities where we say, this is how you win when it comes to black male achievement. To some, a once and future king. Sometimes the crown can feel too heavy and burdensome. Sometimes the crown is too light to even notice it's there. But always, the feeling of purpose is deep in his footsteps. I feel like my name showed the way I was supposed to carry myself. A warrior, freedom fighter. I cannot be beaten. Like, I know all the odds are stacked against me, but when I'm stacked on the top of the shoulders of my father and Baba Chris and Amari and Syro, I'm taller than a giant, man. <laughs> I'm not tripping off of nothing. Wow, and so uh, thank you. Uh, Jamila, could you go to the next slide, please? And so what we know about building high school excellence is that it's very, very hard work, right? Um, we know that there is no magic bullet or magic model uh, that will get us there easily. And we also know that in order for us to get this right, that it's going to take everybody working together. Um, and uh, one of the first things that uh, we operate from a framework of here at CBMA is that when we go into a community, um, we have to identify initiative, initiative partners in order to analyze the network of stakeholders and collaborators, because every community has a network of stakeholders and collaborators. And we know that uh, it's going to take us rolling up our sleeves, bringing these collaborators to the table, some of them uh, believe they're at the table, but we don't really know what work they're doing. And so we have to bring them to the table and say, let's look at what's being done, let's look at what's working, and let's look at what's not working. And if it's not working, let's get rid of it, and if it's working, let's keep it. Um, and so this is a daunting task in and of itself, bringing these people to the table. Uh, but as I said earlier, we must get this right in order to solve this problem, and we must engage every st stakeholder in our community uh, that touch our young men. And so today we have with us uh, three education leaders who understand this work and have been successful. Uh, we have Dr. Yutun De Reeves, uh, uh, principal of Ballou High School, Washington, D.C., Dr. Marlon James from Texas A&M, assistant professor of teaching and learning uh, and culture, uh, associate director also of the Center for Urban uh, School Partnerships, and Dr. Lionel uh, Chief Academic Officer from Urban Prep in Chicago, Illinois. And so we would like for each of them to take five to seven minutes to tell us a little bit uh, about their work and, and about their school and uh, how they've achieved a success with black boys. And we will begin with uh, Dr. Yusundi Reed. Well, good afternoon. Um, I, I am Dr. Yutunde Reed. I'm the principal of Baloo High School. I joined the Baloo High School team in 2014, and Baloo is a comprehensive high school. We're located in Ward 8 in Washington, D.C., and we have many challenges that most urban schools face. And upon my arrival, I knew that the school had tremendous potential. I did a bit of inquiry and observation when I first arrived, and what I learned quickly is that our college-going culture was very limited, and it did exist among a small segment of our student population. And this was an opportunity for our school to think about how to create a school-wide college-going culture, and that's where our leadership team decided to really dig in at that time. In 2015, DCPS decided to launch a new initiative and provide three schools with a full-time college and career coordinator. 
This will be a dedicated role in the building to support post-secondary planning for all students, and this person will work with our counselors. Our administrative team also decided that we needed to really look at raising expectations, improving the quality of instruction, and also thinking about how do you build an environment that students love in addition to really leveraging a college-going culture. I'm sure you're aware that this year 100% of our seniors apply to college, and that is about 190 students. Um, Baloo High School is very unique in that we're a predominantly African-American school. We are 54% of our students are males, so we have 515 young men in our building. And most of our students will be first-generation college students. And so that in and of itself is a unique opportunity to support young people and their families in thinking about college. And so there's been a lot of questions around, well, how did you get 100% of your students to apply to college? And this really began when they were juniors. Their assistant principal, A.P. Strotter, met with the juniors and did some goal setting with them. And the class decided that they wanted to set the goal of 100% of college applications um, for, for their counterparts. And so they did that. Um, this year, the students were supported by their counselor, the college and career coordinator, and the assistant principal. And we would get a weekly update on which students had applied to schools, who hadn't. You know, we were asked to identify students to kind of work with and mentor along the way. And so we were really excited that, you know, this number hit and it was 100%. And because we're a school that is in the neighborhood, we enroll students every day. And so when new seniors would enroll, they too would be encouraged to apply to college. And so to date, 95% of our seniors, 190 of them, have one or more college acceptance letters with $2.7 million in scholarship funds. And so that in and of itself is huge. To take a school like Baloo, we are the third lowest performing high um, in the district, and so thinking about how are we changing outcomes for young people and being able to lead a school where now kids are talking about college applications and they're excited not just about graduation, but what is the next step? And for some of our students who are not on track for graduation, this notion of going to college is now serving as extra motivation to really finish strong and graduate on time to matriculate into college next year. And while we know that not all of them will go to college in the fall, our mission and vision was really making sure that they had the option and real choices when they graduate. Yes, when they graduate. Um, so I know that there's often this focus on, wow, 100% of your students apply. Well, that data point actually fits inside of a larger school-wide effort to create a college-going culture. And so Pat McDonough's research talks about the elements of a college-going culture, which includes college talk, clear expectations, information and resources, comprehensive counseling, testing and curriculum, faculty involvement, family involvement, and college partnerships. And in my own dissertation research, I found that one element that was missing in the research was the power of relationships. And so at Baloo High School, we do a lot to leverage our personal relationships with students and their families, and so that everyone is listing students their potential and not always focusing on the challenges that students may present. And so we do address all the elements of the college going culture work, but again, really leveraging that relationship piece has been incredibly instrumental. We also have um, college readiness programs within our building, such as AVID, which is a school-wide program for 9th through 12th graders. We have 200 students enrolled in an AVID elective, and that course just really focuses on college readiness skills and supporting students with their college journey. We also have a college summit elective, which does something very similar to AVID, in that we're identifying young people who have named causes the next step and providing them with real resources every day to kind of support their planning. And so at Baloo, a third of our young people are enrolled in a college readiness elective, which is significant, in that in most urban schools, young people are kind of forced to figure out that college work um, in isolation. We also have great level counselors who do provide intensive support for students in terms of monitoring progress, providing access and information to families, and another element um, of our work this year has really been focusing on college tours and allowing our young people to actually visit college campuses. They go locally and they also travel outside of the city. And so we've had 26 tours that have been paid for by the district or school funds or grants. Also a private donor has supported some of this work. So imagine having 300 or 400 kids actually be able to talk about when they went to visit Howard or Georgetown or Delaware State. And that has also helped young people really think clearly about What's a college math? I can see myself on this campus. I ran into a former Baloo student, and it's really helping them, again, I think, set their eyes on their next step. In addition to our college readiness work, we've also launched school-wide strategies to address real climate issues, 
we're a neighborhood school, and so often we're still forced to teach young people how to resolve conflicts and really think about those soft skills that sometimes aren't necessarily taught explicitly in school. And so we have restorative justice practices in our building. All of our staff have been trained, and we also have a youth court that is allowing young people to really help us be problem solvers in how we address climate issues in our building. We also do a great job of leveraging our male staff members and coaches. Many of our young men um, are being pr primarily raised by their mothers, and so we want to make sure that our young men have access to really positive role models. And so our custodial foremen, our coaches, our climate and culture team members really wrap their arms around our young men and serve as mentors and role models, um, and they really encourage and support our young men in thinking about life after high school and what does it mean to be a man in society. And lastly, DCPS launched an initiative to focus on males of color. And so we applied, and we were, we were the recipient of a grant, and we launched an all-male academy to really focus on ninth and 10th graders and ensuring that they have academic and social-emotional support as they navigate high school. And so we have 115 ninth and 10th graders who are in their own area of the building. They wear a very significant special uniform. They have a dedicated staff that includes a dean and a social worker. And our whole theory of action was really to isolate them from, you know, female distractions and really focus on their academics and provide them with monthly enrichment activities to really expose them to other things they may typically not be involved in. We've also really had tremendous community support and many, young, many men volunteer their time to just be an extra input um, and influence for our young men. And so we're excited that 115 young men have access to this very individualized academy experience, and they're doing extremely well. But what we've seen as a school in three years is that our kids are certainly more invested in their academic and school success. There's a lot more ownership of our climate and culture from our young people. Their conversations are shifting um, from things that teenagers may talk about to really asking about college and career and really advocating for themselves. Our student satisfaction rate has grown. We have now 84% of our students are reporting that they actually really like and love their school. In March, we tested 100 more 11th graders on the SAT. And so we know that that test is a gatekeeper to college. And so thinking about March assessment, we had 100 more young people sit for that exam, and we're excited to take it. Um, and so we're really excited that we're creating a culture where it's the norm to go to college. It's the norm to go on a college visit as opposed to an isolated activity for a few young people. I had a young man tell me recently that, and I quote, Baloo is a family, and students have to be humble and willing to be coached. I am a young man from the hood going to college. And so that quote just is really significant in that our young people are starting to see their power and potential as future college students. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Reeves. That was a fantastic testimony. Uh, next, we will have uh, Dr. Marlon James from Texan, Texas A&M uh, University. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we appreciate uh, the opportunity to discuss something that we all are incredibly passionate about. A little bit about myself, um, you all seen the work I do in terms of being a professor, but I came from the south side of Chicago, born and raised in public schools, housing project, um, was not a good student, graduated high school with a 2.5 GPA, and then went to college and went to community college for four years, had to, I tested around probably the ninth grade in terms of reading and math when I got to community college. So I had to spend four years at community college catching up and then getting my associates. I decided to, um, you know, then I earned my bachelor's and a master's and I went to teaching. Um, and I went to teaching to try to make a difference for young men like me, young girls who came from communities like mine. Uh, I started teaching at the community college level, um, and I, I thought I was going to be teaching college level content, but found that eventually I was t end up teaching boys from East St. Louis and West and South Side of Chicago, and they were reading at about the fifth grade to eighth grade reading level. And so part of my early professional career was trying to make community college work for them. And uh, I did a lot of developmental reading strategy, developmental mathematics strategy, while teaching all about inequality and social change and things like that. Um, consequently, um, I found myself trying to figure out why was this continuing to happen? What, what was the source of this problem? Um, 
what I decided to do then was to go and pursue a PhD in urban education to try to acquire the skill set that I would need in order to um, make a difference beyond the young men who were in my classroom. But I am happy to say that I have, I have several young men now who are doing master's degrees, pursuing PhDs from those early careers of teaching of mine. Um, I then went to ministry as well because I wanted to um, make a, a, you know, I just felt that I was called to do the work and wanted to make a difference directly in the community. So I bring to the work that I do at, at the university kind of all these lenses, an urban kid, an urban educated kid, an educator, a minister. And so I try to do real work, work that the academy is technically not designed nor, support, nor supports. So I'll tell you a little bit more about the work that I do. If you go to the next slide, um, I'm all about bringing the power of research to, a, to be used by families and by communities, by churches, by organizations. And I do so primarily through partnerships because part of what I, what I see is the pressing problem is that we all are trying to make a difference. But when it comes to black boys, we are underfunded, under-resourced, understaffed. And so I see partnerships as a way of um, filling in those resource gaps. So part of what I do is I, I find ways to make the college, the community, the churches, the families work together better. So as I look at um, the great work that um, CBMA has done to look at college readiness via the high school, um, I'm always focused on it because I've taught at every single collegiate level. Now I train, now I train other researchers, right? I've done the community college, taught at every single level. So I'm looking at community at college and, and from a broader perspective, from a, a, a fifth grade from a, a kid who comes in reading at the fifth grade to someone pursuing a PhD. There's specific things that they need, in my view. And so I present, presented, I took what CBMA has done, and I, and I added a couple levels to it, the college student, the college ready, and then readiness for excellence. And they provided for us some indicators of what effective high schools look like. Um, the principal spoke about a few. I know um, we're going to hear a few more coming up. But I believe that every kid, of course, if they want to be a college student, they have to perform socially and academically above, uh, above average. Um, community colleges, like I went to, they can, they can get into them fairly straightforward if they have these standards. Um, access to high-quality advising is critical. Advising serves as a gateway for that pushes most of our students, honestly, out of the college growing experience. But that advisory plan needs to happen, in my opinion, uh, prior to their eighth grade year. So the, the summer transition camps um, are important because in the, in, by the time they get to freshman year, the, all of the issues, the achievement gap grows to about two and a half years in, in, by eighth grade. Um, suspensions, expulsions, arrests, they go through the roof of black males. So they need a transition to the eighth grade. So um, I, I'd be interested in talking about that. Um, for the next level, they need college tours like, like uh, the principal was talking about, but they need to also visit all the different types of colleges, the community college, the HBCU, the state, and then a land-grant university, right? Um, mm -hmm. They need to do that as often as possible because they beca college becomes demystified. So, so sometimes, if they were like me, they grew up in a neighborhood, colleges were all around me in Chicago. I've just never seen any. Um, they also need to engage in some STEM enrichment. You know, there's some stuff we can do after school. In Chicago, we did a program called Youth Hope out in Bolingbrook, Illinois, where we partnered with the local churches. They built electric cars. They did all sorts of really cool stuff. But the church served as a hub to get all of this community expertise organized for these after-school programs. So we can talk about some models that um, have shown results. Um, STEM is important, of course, because most of the jobs are going to be STEM-related. Bottom line, mentoring and leadership opportunities. So when I study black male leaders who are highly successful in almost every walk of life, they had mentoring opportunities. They were mentored by other men and other women who cared about them. Now let's get to some of these things, the honors and AP courses. 40% of the achievement difference between African Americans and whites is caused by honors and AP course access, 40% of it. You can basically cut the achievement gap in half by giving them about three to four honors and AP courses in high school. I've done the research, I proved it. There's no doubt that this, this is indeed the case. 
These are important because they track well into how they perform in, in college, right? Uh, college is something else that we did in Chicago. We partnered with the Capital Leadership Institute of Chicago when I was a professor at Loyola. We brought their boys to, a, to college on Saturday, so they got to see a college function. They got to be taught by college professors. They got, they got to see a college syllabus. They got to see college rubrics. They got to see our online systems. They got to see the libraries and how to do research at the libraries. Um, because we want to demystify this as, as much as possible. School systems are not set up to do all this, so this is why partnerships are so essential. I think every black male in this country needs access to study abroad. Study abroad has been linked to higher degree completions, higher certificate completions, higher retention uh, rates, and higher GPAs. Uh, it is absolutely essential that we get more young people um, these type of experiences. So um, I'm going to stop here. And it'd be um, interesting to continue to hear the conversation as we go. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. James. Uh, next up, we'll have uh, Dr. Lionel Allen. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to start by thanking uh, the folks at CBMA for providing a forum for us to talk about um, high excellence. And I want to congratulate uh, Dr. Reeves on the successes that uh, she and her leadership team have realized thus far. It's uh, empowering to know that there are folks around the country that's engaged in the same work, and it's important that we come together and share ideas. Uh, so I'm going to provide a very high-level overview of the work that uh, we are engaging in here at Urban Prep. Uh, you can advance the, the next slide. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about the mission of Urban Prep, and then I'll get into a little bit of our, our programming. Uh, so Urban Prep Academies is a 501c3 founded in 2002 by uh, Tim King and a group of African-American education business and civic leaders, um, and they wanted to establish this uh, organization uh, because the reality that many black men in Chicago um, was living, uh, is living, uh, is a tragic one. Um, young men in Chicago uh, have a better chance of being murdered or committing suicide than they do of uh, earning a college degree. And so this organization was founded to try to provide a, a high-quality education uh, for young black men in the city that will result in their um, graduation from college. So at Urban Prep, what we say to our students, what we say to our families and to our community stakeholders is that uh, we're about degrees, not diplomas. Um, uh, high school graduation is an expectation. Um, high uh, college graduation is also an expectation. And so we've uh, designed all of our programming around making sure that our young men are successful once they get to college. It's just not about getting to college, it's getting through college. Uh, to that end, we established three programs, the schools program, which is what I'm going to talk about today, the Urban Prep Fellows Program, which is a workforce development program that provides uh, alums of Urban Prep who are also recent college graduates opportunities to come back and work for the organization. Over the last few years, we've had about 15 to 20 um, young men uh, come back and, and give back to their communities, give back to the, to the school organization uh, by working uh, for us in various capacities from paraprofessionals to uh, the executive assistant to the CEO uh, to social workers, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we're very proud of the fact that our young men are coming back and giving back to the community. We also have the Urban Prep Alumni Program, extremely important program that we operate, and this program is responsible for providing uh, the navigational support that our young men need, many of whom are first-generation college students, uh, the support they need to get through college. Uh, again, it's not about getting them in the door, it's getting them through the door, and it's important that we provide them with the support that they need to help them deal with all the obstacles that you face as a college student, whether first generation or not. You know, being a freshman in college is tough, and there's an adjustment period. And so we want to make sure that our young men have the support that they need to be able to, to, to navigate those obstacles to, um, to survive and advance uh, through college. You can advance to the next slide, please. Uh, so I want to talk about who we serve. Uh, a lot of our haters out there who like to, to undermine or devalue the work that we do accuse us of, of being selective. Uh, as a charter school in the state of Illinois, we have to be non-selective by law. The only thing that a student has to complete 
in order to be allowed to be accepted into urban prep is to successfully complete eighth grade, and they have to live in the city of Chicago. Those are our only requirements. We don't have any race-based admissions policies. Uh, we don't take into consideration a student's prior academic performance, uh, nor do we take into consideration their ELL or special education status. Having said that, almost a quarter of our students are students with special needs, um, and they you know, range from students who are slightly um, LD1 or have a slight learning disability to students who uh, have uh, more severe uh, emotional and behavioral uh, disorders. Um, about 85 to 90 percent of our students qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, about 90 percent of our students enter urban prep unprepared for the rigors of high school. Uh, as a matter of fact, members of the class of 2019 uh, who are current uh, freshmen, not one student could read or do math at grade level. Uh, about 99% of our students are African American, and of course, 100% uh, of them are male. You advance the slide, please. Um, so we operate three schools. Uh, we have our Inglewood campus, which opened in 2006. Our uh, Bronzeville campus, which opened in, I'm sorry, our West campus, which opened in 2008, and our Bronzeville campus, which opened in 2010. They all are situated in uh, what are considered high needs areas of Chicago. Inglewood is one of the most violent um, communities in the nation. Uh, as a matter of fact, of the almost 800 murders uh, that took place in Chicago, uh, about 75 to 80 percent of them took place in the communities that our schools are located in. So we're talking about uh, impoverished, highly violent communities, and we want our schools to really serve as a beacon of light to show what is possible. Um, I want to highlight a few of, of the things that make us unique, but I'll start with something that goes beyond our programming and, and teaching and learning. One of the things that makes us unique that's often not discussed is that Urban Prep was founded by black people for young black men, right? This is a for us, by us organization. And we're very proud of that. We're very proud that, that black folks in Chicago, those who understood the benefits of education, decided to come together and take a stand against uh, the harsh reality that so many of our young men face and wanted to make sure that they had the opportunities to be successful. We know that they have the potential to be successful is are they provided with the access uh, to education, to health care, to all these other things that are so very important in helping our young men to be successful. As it relates to teaching and learning, um, we have implemented uh, data-driven instructional cycles. So our young men will sit for interim assessments about every eight to nine weeks. Um, the data that we get back from those assessments is given in real time, so teachers are able to respond to that data almost immediately. Uh, we've devised a college prep curriculum. It was once reverse engineered from the ACT college readiness standards. In the state of Illinois, we've since transitioned to the SAT, so we're in the process of redesigning you know, our curriculum to make sure that it is tightly aligned to the SAT um, dimensions. Our young men take the equivalent of eight years of English and six years of mathematics, and this is because they come to us so academically deficient, we have to increase the amount of time that they are present in their core classes. Uh, we've designed a UP framework for teaching, which uh, codifies and articulates the expectations of teachers and how we want them to comport themselves as deliverers of instruction to make sure they're providing high-quality instruction to our young men. Uh, in terms of programming, I mentioned the extended school day, so our students are in school from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., and that is done primarily uh, as a way to keep them safe. Uh, a lot of the violence that uh, uh, impacts so many of our students happens uh, between 2.30 and, and 4 o'clock. And so we don't dismiss to 4.30, and many of our young men are involved in after-school activities, which means that they're in school sometimes until 6.30. So the longer they are in school, the better for them as it relates to their physical safety. Um, we have an all-school morning meeting that we call Community. It's one of our most sacred urban prep rituals, and during Community, we, we celebrate our young men. We do emotional check-ins with our young men. Um, we encourage them, we empower them, we motivate them to be successful. It's a, it's a production. Uh, it's a production that we do every day at all of our campuses, um, but it really helps, helps set the tone uh, for the kind of data we want to create, but it also is an integral part of the positive school culture that we're trying to, to maintenance day to day. Uh, our students take a college process course, so senior year, 
they they take a class. It's called a college process. It's, it's a 45-minute class that meets every day. And in that class, which is taught by a college counselor, um, our young men are sort of led through the college application process. Um, they are required to complete uh, 11 applications. Uh, they have safe schools they have to apply to. They have sort of the schools that, and those are the schools they know they're going to get in, and they have sort of the, the top tier schools, and they have the dream schools. So there's a, a continuum of applications that we want them to complete. Uh, they have to complete, it is a requirement. They have to complete the FAFSA. If they don't complete the FAFSA, they cannot go to prom. Uh, and, and during that process, we are helping them to write their essays. They help them tell their stories. Uh, we're helping them, again, to navigate the college application process, and we're making sure that, you know, the fact that they are first-generation college students is not a, an excuse to not apply to college. So when folks ask us, well, how is it that year after year you all have 100% of your students accepted to four-year colleges and universities is because we are intentional about it, um, and we have set aside uh, significant amounts of time throughout that student's school day to ensure um, that they are applying to college. The second semester of the school year focuses on college enrollment, making sure that we help them navigate the enrollment process. Again, it's one thing to get an acceptance letter. That's great. But if, you're not, if you haven't gone through the enrollment process and you, and you don't know how to do that and you don't have the assistance, oftentimes that's enough to you know, scare you from going. And so we are uh, helping them to navigate that process as well. And then Pride is a class that our young men sit in every day. Again, it's a 45-minute class, just like English or math. And it's a class that helps to build their character and that's really grounded in the Illinois uh, social emotional learning standards. So it's there that we're really teaching young men how to be young men. The theme for freshman year is uh, transition to high school. For sophomore year, the theme is identity. For junior year, the theme is college uh, readiness. And for senior year, the theme is college success. Uh, you can advance the slide, please. Thank you. A couple of our proof points, and I'll, and I'll, uh, I'll sort of end here. Uh, you know, again, for the last seven years, uh, Soon to be eight, hint, hint, 100% of our urban prep graduates have been accepted to four-year colleges and universities. You know, our graduation rates exceed the African-American male district average. Our college enrollment rates exceed uh, district, state, and national averages. Just to give you a sense of the impact that one small network of schools can have, in the fall of 2015, one out of uh, nine African-American males enrolling in college as a freshman from Chicago was an urban prep alumnus. And we only, you know, we have every year about 300 uh, graduates. So, you know, 300 young men had that type of an impact uh, on, on the, the college landscape as it relates to students graduating from Chicago. It also speaks to just how dire the circumstances are here in Chicago as it relates to black males going to college. Um, and people always say, again, haters will say, well, you, you know, you get them in college, but do they stay? And the answer is yes. They persist at about a 72% rate. Uh, which is not anything that we're satisfied with, but we it definitely exceeds you know African American male district averages uh, as well as the national average. So again, we consider ourselves an organization that has had some successes, but we have a lot of work to do uh, to 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 be the kind of organization that we want to be and to have the impact that we want to have. So I'll stop there, and I look forward to continuing this conversation around high school excellence. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to open it up to the audience. If you have questions, feel free to use the chat box to submit questions that you have for our presenters um, in general. But we do have a couple to start with. Um, somebody wants to know more about kind of each of your approaches to parent engagement um, and especially kind of implementing youth and parent uh, structure and relations within, the, within uh, different school systems. So I can speak to that. Okay. This is, mm -hmm. I can speak to that. Um, this is Dr. Reeves, and that is certainly one of our um, challenge opportunity areas. Um, many of our parents obviously are deeply invested in their students being successful, but we typically think about parent engagement as parents coming into the school walls and doing something that the school is asking parents to do. And our approach is a little bit different. We really want parents to have information um, and to feel a part of the process. And so now we're in the process of and people submitting FAFSA, and that's one area where parents need a lot of support. There's a lot of anxieties around providing financial information. Um, and so what that looks like at Baloo is it looks like us calling parents and having conversations with parents about the importance of FAFSA, answering questions that they may have, and not just assuming that because they're not rushing to the school to submit this, that that means they're not supporting their children. Um, we make a lot of phone calls. Um, 
our climate and culture team, they do home visits. Um, and that's a team that really has a deep relationship with our families. And so we're really trying to leverage parents' connections with adults in the building the same way we work with young people. Um, and we have to be very patient and encourage teachers to be mindful that we still have to call, even if the behaviors don't shift immediately with young people, that our responsibility is to sort of reach out to parents. And so it's something that we haven't necessarily um, reached success around, but we're really, really vigilant in trying to make sure that parents feel like the school is a partner and really value their participation in the process. I guess my, my concern for parents is developing tools. You know, I have a, I'm a parent of three kids, so I think as a parent many times in my job, and, you know, I'm about developing the tools that parents need to organize their families, right? So a lot of parents, particularly for boys, they don't understand how the boys are developing. They think the boys are having these problems and the world is going in, but the parents can do a lot of stuff at home. So I'm about developing tools. So the parents know how the how their houses need to be organized, so they can send to the school the very best prepared young man as possible. Uh, we're, I'm dealing with things like how do parents control the internet, and how do parents control access to the internet? How do the parents structure study time at home with boys? How do parents, if the if the kid is behind, what can the parents do at home to improve um, the academic learning for their kids? Um, and so for me, I see it from the I see it from the community perspective, and it's about for me it's about how do you use your churches, how do you use your neighbors, how do you use your parents, how do you use the older brothers and sisters to kind of fill in the gaps that uh, traditional that I guess middle class families won't necessarily have, um, but those are the kind of resources that we try to provide through the center so that parents will have access to uh, one of the things for example that black parents do very well and black children do very well that the country really doesn't know is that they utilize technology more than any other group in the entire country. They utilize the Internet more than any other group in the whole country, and it doesn't matter if they're poor, if they're from urban areas or suburban areas. Black, the black community is leading the country in a lot of these techie areas, but parents don't know how to use that as they do homework and all of those things with, with, with children. So I'm trying to help organize um, these different resources, and particularly starting as early as before they even get to pre-K, how do you make your kid a strong reader, right? And then how do you respond to teacher misbehavior? How do you respond to misbehavior of your kid in, in school system? So um, I'm trying to deal with the practical aspects of parenting so that black parents um, uh, are not more engaged, because we are engaged, but um, we, we have more tools that we can use. Awesome. So we have another question um, that wants to kind of know for each of you, um, are you all in partnership or in collaboration with any national initiatives that also focus on high school excellence or college and career readiness, um, specifically thinking about My Brother's Keeper um, or other um, national or organizations or initiatives that are in this space or in this work more broadly? Absolutely. Uh, the Campaign for Black Male Achievement um, is definitely in partnership with My Brother's Keeper, um, as well as some of the other initiatives uh, that we indicated on the screen uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, the difference is that uh, one of the differences is that uh, the Campaign for Black Male Achievement is engaged in the work on the ground from some of the other initiatives that started uh, regarding uh, black men and boys are in that field. And so we are doing a deep dive into five core cities uh, around the country, uh, Milwaukee, Detroit, Oakland, uh, uh, Baltimore, and uh, Louisville, um, to make sure that we are uh, using these best practices and using these resources to elevate uh, particular schools in those districts uh, to make sure that they're meeting the mark that uh, to the schools that we've highlighted here today. And so uh, in that engagement, we definitely uh, enlist the help of uh, co the communities that uh, we serve and so the stakeholders within those communities. And it's a big lift, right, because we're coming from the outside and we're going into the community uh, wrapping resources around uh, and, and, and assistance around those who are already on the ground and those who know best uh, what's needed for their community uh, to make sure that they have what they need to build the capacity to, to move the needle on what we're doing with uh, b uh, black boys. 
Um, and Dr. Allen, this question is for you. Somebody wants to know what support do you offer students once they're in college? Uh, so that's a great question. It really depends on what the student needs. I mean, one of the things that we do is we partner with um, colleges that have had a history of African American male success. So one of the things we do on the front end is try to identify those schools where our boys are more likely to succeed in and try to guide them to those schools. Um, we also uh, connect with folks on the campus to make sure that we are aware of all the resources that are available to the students. So when students have issues, we can direct them to the appropriate place to, to get the services that they need. Um, we follow them on Facebook. We follow them on Twitter and Snapchat. Um, some of our students have given us access to their student accounts so we can monitor their grades and we have access to their transcripts. Um, we visit um, students uh, to check on them to make sure, particularly if we you know, get word through the, through the grapevine that they may be um, going through some troubles or having some issues and they may have disconnected from us because they you know, are too manly to ask for help then we'll, we'll go down there and visit with them just to make sure that they're okay. I mean, we've done everything from drive students down to their campuses to um, helping out on tuition. I mean, again, it really depends on what the student needs. That's really what drives the, the kind of supports that we uh, provide to students. Thank you. And we have another question, which is I mean, it's for all of you, actually. Um, how do you each engage leadership within schools um, and also at the school district level in the work that you all are doing, um, and especially in the work of providing support to black women and boys. Well, I mean, I think I'm fortunate that in DCPS they've really made this a, a focus of our work, um, and so there have been conversations, there's been resources. We're a recipient of a grant that focuses on men of color, um, so it's been actually a really timely conversation between what we're doing in our building and then what the district is also um, launching. My entire admin team is African American. I work with um, several leaders who really have it as their own passion. Um, so it's something that we're all deeply committed to. And again, the district is certainly supportive of our work and it's a district wide conversation. Yeah, I, I would, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, uh, brother, oh, Dr. Go ahead. James. Oh, go ahead, brother. You got it. No, I'm going to defer to the professor. No. <laughs> um, I, I would say, uh, thankfully, because of uh, former President Obama and his uh, attention and commitment to uh, addressing issues that are affecting young men of color through MBK and, and otherwise, um, it has be, become sexy to, to really support this work, and folks who uh, were, were not as engaged are, are now more engaged in, in this issue of black male achievement. Um, in Chicago, uh, we are at crisis um, levels as it relates to the number of black men that are, that are harmed by the system. 48% um, of black men in Chicago between the ages of 18 and 24 are not in school and they're unemployed. Um, and of the almost 800 murders that took place in Chicago last year, uh, over 50% of them were young black men uh, between the ages of 18 and 34. Uh, so there's just a lot of work to be done. Most people are now starting to acknowledge it, and so it's been very easy to engage folks, at least in the conversation. What has not been easy is to get people to put money uh, behind these initiatives. So there's a lot of talk. There's a lot of sort of vocal support for the work, but we haven't gotten the kind of hard money support that we would like to, to see and like to benefit from as we try to do this every day. Yeah, so let me let me say this quickly. Um, I, I think this is why we, we need the partnerships, right, because our work is it tend to be undervalued, it tends to be underfunded, and a lot of these resources are going to these uni to universities who, who really don't have the – they don't have any anyone like me, for example, who came from the city and came up through the system. Um, and the money is – they're using the money for all sorts of things. But what I try to do is a lot of schools don't even – like you talk about, okay, how do we engage school leadership and district leadership? A lot of them don't even want to recognize the problem. They don't want to, they don't want to see it. But I, so what I, part, part of what my job is, is is to educate district leaders who don't even want to recognize that their achievement gap is call, being caused by 90% of their black boys not doing well, Right. So part of what I have to do is put into language the research that 
the leader to read and understand and, and take a move on. So it has to be written in such a way that the school board can understand it, the parents can understand it, that even eighth grade students can understand it. So I spent a lot of time doing that. The second piece is um, my brother's keepers, like I was – Paul Public Charter out in D.C., you know, they contracted with me and a couple other brothers to come in because they didn't even know where to begin, right? They were doing work here and there. But what we tried to do is create a manual for districts who don't even know where to start, right? So we created a system where they can come in and, and figure out what data they need to collect, what information they're missing about their boys. Because the one thing you don't want to do is just start throwing programming at the boys without any input or any insight into what the boys are struggling with. So we tried to create a, a very user-friendly system to kind of get the process started. And it, and it ties back into a lot of the work that, um, that everyone has been talking about. But you know, then there's a, this issue of, okay, as a, as, a, as a university, part of what we can do is we can offer the research. We can partner to write grants because that's part of what my job is. I have to write grants and I have to do research I'm fortunate that I can do research around my community, around the men in my community, but there's so many brothers and sisters out there who want to do the work, but they can't find connections in the community. So I think we have to have conversations about how to connect the ground level work with the grant writers, with the researchers. And then for me too, I'm big into preparing teachers, right? Because it's not going to make a difference if we keep pumping out teachers who don't like black men. Um, and so I spent a lot of time working on how to prepare teachers, how to put them in urban districts for a whole year so that they're practicing those skill sets. So they're working with young black men, young black girls. Uh, but there's a lot of things that we do. Great. Thank you all um, so much. If anybody had any additional questions, you can go ahead and still enter into the chat box and we'll save them and we'll make sure we get them answered. Um, for you by the presenters, but we want to go through the kind of final slides before um, we close out here. We do want to know for future webinars um, uh, that are focused on high school excellence, that are engaging um, different practitioners, educators, and, and leaders, what the preferred time is, um, and also taking into account uh, the time and, and the cost difference. So if you all could take a few minutes to just do, or two seconds actually, um, just to do a live vote of the poll and the time, and then we'll close out. So you can click it right on your screen, or if you're joining via phone and can't click it on your screen, you can shoot us an email, um, and we will make sure to, to get your vote. All right, we'll give it a couple more seconds. Awesome. Thank you all. Um, so in closing, I'll hand it back over to Chris. Thank you, Jamila. So uh, I would like to uh, first thank uh, all of the participants as well as our presenters uh, uh, on behalf of Sean Dove, our CEO, for participating uh, in this webinar. Uh, we are deeply appreciative of you taking this time out to, to get this critical uh, information. Um, you can definitely, uh, don't forget to follow us at, uh, on Twitter at BMA, BM uh, Achievement or on Facebook uh, at Campaign for Black Male Achievement or uh, on Instagram, Campaign for BMA. Uh, that way you can stay uh, updated on all of our webinars and all of the information that we have uh, coming out. And, of course, our website, blackmaleachievement.org are the best ways to keep track of us, register, and if you're not a member, become a member. Uh, we have to keep this movement going. <laughs>